Yeah. So we might move the thing back. Okay, a we're we live a now. Thing. Yeah. Oh, that looks great. If you stand about there, is it yeah, terrible? No, no. It's okay. Then you're gonna have to move. Yeah. <laughs> That looks good. Okay. Okay. All right, we're good. Thank you. Yes. Do you have problems with the fog this morning? No, not, you know, it was late enough. I mean, right, yeah. Was, yeah, go ahead. She yeah, 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 go ahead and start. Two minutes early. That's, that's, that's all right. It's just two minutes early. Well, by, by the tablet, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> that's all that uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. I, I, I'm seen many of you before, but maybe not all. I'm Julia O'Brien. I'm the Old Testament, also known as Hebrew Bible professor at Lancaster Theological Seminary. Um, and we're now starting to talk about ourselves as with a slash in there. You may have heard that Lancaster Seminary is in the process of joining together with Moravian Theological Seminary in Bethlehem We'll keep our campus, on, and we'll stay like Sir Seminary in campus, but we're starting a partnership where we're working with Moravian Theological colleagues to design a new curriculum, right? Um, we're really excited about it because we're really hoping to use similar kind of technology that you guys are on the vanguard of <laughs> so that we can, we can really... Um, reach more students who are looking for theological education, for pastoring, for chaplaincy, for nonprofit work. So um, just want to say that if you know anybody, yourself included, that might be interested in theological education of some variety, we'd love to hear from you. So you're, you're welcome to reach me or to find the Lancaster Seminary website. We're, we're really excited about some of the new things that we're gonna be doing and some of the new partnerships. Being affiliated with Moravian University, you may know that too, that Moravian College has transitioned into Moravian University. They have a lot of new programs that they're also trying to launch from the, our Lancaster campus so that we'll, we'll have more synergy with things going all around. So let us know if, if there's people we could talk to. Um, I'm really excited. I get to talk for two weeks about the book of Jeremiah, right? Now, uh, when I come into a church like this, I always think about like, I wonder what people already know <laughs> about the book of Jeremiah. And I don't mean to underestimate you, but I kind of assume that most people don't know very much. Is that it? Yeah. Should I go ahead and say that? Yeah. So that you can say, she, she's coming in there. So I was trying to imagine, like, if a person would have heard about the book of Jeremiah, where would you have heard it? What, what might you have heard? So I'm going to give it a shot, and then you can tell me what, what you think you might have uh, heard. So if you've ever been, so I guess I don't know this about dairy. That is your, are your sermons preached from the Revised Common Lectionary? Do you know? They're not. Not anymore. Not anymore. It used to be. Yeah. Right. Um, at, at any time of the year, it's not the lectionary, you don't think? Well, there's allusion to the season. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I thought about that. If, if you've either here or somewhere else, if you've ever been in uh, church spaces that do use the Revised Common Lectionary, do you, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. The Revised Common Lectionary. Yeah. Right, you know, this, this you yeah, know, uh, Roman Catholic and kind of mainline Protestant agreement that there's a cycle of readings that you do over a three-year period. What year are we in now? I was trying yeah, to you know, A, B, or C. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like this track. Yeah, so we're in your C. Um, in, that, in that way. Um, so, Jeremiah, right. uh, there's particular passages that will show up from Jeremiah if you're in a setting like the lectionary. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute. It's 
They're fairly unrepresentative <laughs> passages from Jeremiah, but they're famous ones. So you might have heard some of these passages. So for example, some of the seasons, some of the years on Easter, you'll get a passage from Jeremiah with these wonderful hopes about the future of Jerusalem, that the walls are gonna be built, virgin Jerusalem is gonna be uh, restored. So we get that. Um, you may have heard this passage that shows up several times in Lent. It's in Jeremiah that there is a promise that in the future there will be a new covenant written on people's hearts. All right, so you get that one. Um, in Advent, uh, it shows up. Uh, there's also a promise in Jeremiah. Can you see a theme? of what the lectionary is picking promises for the future, right? Um, and that promise is that a righteous branch will spring up from a, a righteous, how do I say it? Yes, a righteous branch will spring up from the house of David. Um, and in Epiphany, there's a passage that some people have heard from the book of Jeremiah is actually even on a billboard uh, somewhere, I think it's on 222, is that right? Before, uh, I knew you in the room before you were born, right? So um, that's actually used by some folks who are um, trying to do some anti-abortion work. They'll, they'll hold on to this one. Um, so really, those are the only, uh, I might have missed one or two, but Pretty much, these are the representative ones that promises for the future, which you can imagine, even if you've never heard those passages, how they get, how you're invited to connect them with Jesus. So if there's going to be a new covenant written on the heart, oh yeah, we have a new covenant, and actually that's where we get the word New Testament, is covenant, testament, this idea that, that uh, the story of Jesus is the new covenant with people. So that uh, a righteous branch from David, this kind of understanding that is a prediction of Jesus. And then the one in Epiphany is not quite, oh, I touched it, sorry. <laughs> uh, the, the one in Epiphany, it's not quite as obvious why they would do that in there, but it's this sense of that God is present with us uh, in the now, there's, while I'm mentioning the lectionary, which, you know, nobody might really care, um, there's a funny thing in the lectionary. The lectionary committee got such heat because of the way they used the Old Testament that they came up with an option for the season after Pentecost, which is what we call the summer. <laughs> right, when A, nobody's going to church anyway, right, nobody's going to church anyway, and um, uh, this is often a lot of times where for ministers might be on vacation and you've got guest speakers or stuff, so anyway, the, the heat that the lectionary committee got is that for, for Lent, for Advent, you know, the big liturgical seasons, what the committee did was they chose gospel passages that would go with each of these Sundays. And, and you might even know that the lectionary committee, like for years A, B, and C, one year they'll do like the Holy Week story from, uh, they'll do it from Matthew one year, and then they'll do it from Luke one year, and then they'll do it from Mark. But they, they is always driven by the gospel passage. And then what they do is they go grab an Old Testament passage that is either connected historically by the church, like these. You, you can almost guess what the New Testament passages would be that they chose these to go with. So, you know, this is an advent of uh, Jesus from the long day. You know, so they, they choose an Old Testament passage to kind of bump up what the gospel's saying, or maybe the gospel is using a, alluding to a story in the Old Testament that you might not know that story, so they'll 
they'll include that. There's this passage in um, John, in the Gospel of John, that we read in Lent about, you know, um, about Jesus is going to be lifted up, and they'll refer back to this passage in the book of Numbers. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too Jesus was lifted up. So, you know, then they, for the Old Testament reading, they go grab the, the story of the serpent in the wilderness. So, um, people like me, who really believe that the Old Testament has its own integrity, right? Mm -hmm. That, like, it's, it's more than a collection of verses that you can just go pick up and use willy-nilly to support your own belief system, which, you know, we all do that, um, in that way, that, that that's, that's not... A, they got a lot of heat from Old Testament professors and other people and say, you're not giving the church an opportunity to gain the wisdom and the value from the richness of the Old Testament in its own right. And whether you mean to or not, lectionary committee, you're perpetuating this idea that the Old Testament is only good for background or predictions, and, and there's a lot of cool stuff we never got to talk about. So, what the lectionary committee did said, okay, we hear you, and so several years ago, uh, when they did this revision, they came up with this uh, option that churches could use during the seasons after Pentecost, during the, the summer, that they'll give you, you can, you can keep doing the, this path, or they'll give you long swatches, swaths, uh, long swaths of Old Testament readings. So they might, like, take you through the story of Ruth. Oh, you would never get Ruth otherwise. Or they might take you through the book of Esther, or some of those stories in Genesis, like, you know, Joseph and his brothers. So it, it'll do that. And there's one year, and uh, it's actually year C, um, where that option will take you through the prophets. So it'll take you through Isaiah, Jeremiah, they'll take you through Amos and Hosea, so that you actually get to hear passages that you wouldn't get to hear because they haven't been matched up with a gospel. It is true that uh, these, they're, they're in year C, which I think this is year C, that we're getting ready to come up on, it would have been an option, if you were doing the lectionary, uh, is to do like lots of readings, and nine readings show up from the book of Jeremiah. You, you can get a big uh, thrust of Jeremiah, which, uh, may, I'll talk about this in a minute, that in itself needs some care taken to it. And you'll understand why I say that when, don't worry, I'm getting there. What's actually in the book of Jeremiah? Don't worry, we're, we're getting there. So you might have heard some of these things. I was thinking, what do people know about Jeremiah? Well, maybe they've heard something preached. Uh, or at least read, because don't we know, sometimes Preachers will read the Old Testament passage but preach on the gospel. So some people, they might hear a Old Testament passage read but never hear it preached. I have students at Lancaster Seminary who grew up in the church, and when I ask them, they maybe heard somebody preach on the Old Testament maybe three times in their life. Right. So, um, but, oh, what else could you have heard about your mind? Um, stories. There's some great stories in the book of Jeremiah. Um, maybe, uh, and some of these stories show up in hymns too, so you might have heard them. So there's a great story about Jeremiah. He goes to a potter's house, and the potter is making a pot, and it turns out badly, and the potter throws it away. And then that becomes a lesson about when God's not happy with how things are going, God might start over again. So, 
um, the there's a uh, hymn. I am the potter. Oh, I meant you are the potter. I am the clay. Right. You know. So they, things like that they show up in devotional readings. They show up in hymns. Um, maybe you've heard this. People didn't like what Jeremiah was saying, and they threw him in a cistern. Depending on your translation, it's a well. Like, um, and he he was a prophet who gets a lot of pushback, right? So he's, maybe maybe you've heard that one. Um, I can't see it on my screen. Oh, and and maybe this one, maybe not. I was trying to be um, optimistic of things people might have heard about Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah also, there's a story that, and I'll come back to this, that while something really bad is happening in his city, his city is being attacked in war, and he goes out and buys real estate. So he goes out and he, get, he buys a field, and that passage is often remembered as an example of how in the midst of crisis you can believe in the possibility of the future. So, I don't know. I don't know. Any of these things? <laughs> have, you, have you ever heard? So, anyway. Um, yeah, okay, that one. Um, maybe you've heard these passages. Um, I've heard, I've seen this in a lot of like little devotional books. Again, which is another place where people take a verse out of what we call context, you know, out of literary context, and they do it and ask people to meditate on it, think about what it means for their own lives. Right. A lot of traditions have these uh, devotional guides. Some people might know about, um, why did I just blank on the name of it? The, the Daily Grid, Upper Room, you know, uh, things like that. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you future with a hope. So imagine, you know, you're doing your devotional or you're in a Bible study group and you begin to reflect on that. That would be really good news. I mean, I get why people grab that one. You know, because it, it allows you to believe that God has good intentions for your life. So that one shows up a lot. Um, some people, not as familiar, but have heard this one. And as I'm going to explain, this kind of feeds into Jeremiah's reputation. Jeremiah uh, is reported to have lamented, Oh, that my head were a fountain, a spring of water, in my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Passages like this, and some that we'll look at again, have given Jeremiah the reputation as being a weeping prophet. So if you've ever heard Jeremiah the weeping prophet, well part of that is the reason is that more than other and particularly books in the prophetic section of the Bible, Jeremiah will lament the task that he's given, and he'll lament over the sadness of the realities that he seems in front of him. So he he's not really complaining as much as lamenting. And that's why when you get paintings, I thought maybe they've seen a painting right, or seeing some kind of art, that when you get art about Jeremiah, he never looks happy. <laughs> he really doesn't. This is a really famous uh, painting of Jeremiah by Rembrandt. I don't know how much you can see from where you are, but, like, he, he's pretty sad. He's, you know, got his hand on his, uh, head on his hand. And back here, I'm giving hints of what's going to be in the book of Jeremiah, is the city of Jerusalem burning. So Jerusalem is burning, and here's this uh, dejected man who's kind of looking away from it, uh, like even leaning away from it in sadness about what has happened to his uh, 
city. Uh, because this is uh, the area of uh, the Bible that I do most of my own academic work, I've not only studied these books, but I've studied the way people have interpreted them over time, which is really fascinating to me. And what fast, one of the many things that fascinates me is that uh, what will happen is that popular speakers can get interested in a particular prophet or a particular something, and then they can like popularize certain views about things in places where people who would never set foot inside of a church, never been in a church, might have encountered. So uh, those of us who uh, are of a certain age right, <laughs> might have heard of one of the most famous preachers who in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, right, this guy named Harry Emerson Fosdick. Um, Fosdick is just amazing to me. He taught at Union Theological Seminary for a long time, but he was the most popular writer um, in all kinds of things. I looked at this guy's archives. He wrote in the Reader's Digest he wrote for Time Magazine. He wrote for the Ladies' Home Journal. He had a weekly radio broadcast. And he was one of the preachers who got enlisted by the US military to kind of go and popularize um, like religious support of the military. Some people think that he's part of the basis of that joke. Have you heard the joke? A priest, a rabbi, and a minister walk into a bar. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> Some people think that's based on this, the uh, he and a rabbi um, and a Roman Catholic priest kind of worked together and they would go on these stumps um, to kind of talk about chaplaincy in the military, kind of promote uh, the military as a legitimate Christian calling in that way. And guess what? Fosdick loved Jeremiah. He talked about Jeremiah everywhere he went. He had it on his radio broadcast. He had it, um, he taught about it, and he really picked up on that idea Next time, I won't put anything down at the bottom of the slide. I, I learned that right now. Um, he picked up on that idea of Jeremiah not only as a weeping prophet, but, and this is going to be really important, Jeremiah is an individual who is like a loner person who is willing to stand up to institutions that he had in a deep inner personal religious experience he felt deeply and for him for Fosdick and other people Jeremiah became this image of what it meant to be a prophet in in progressive liberal circles so some of you have heard me talk about this before in progressive liberal circles to be a prophet means not to predict the future it means to be somebody who's willing to stand up to people in power uh, to to you know critique systems so if you're in a these kind of churches if you hear a prophetic sermon what that means is they're going to call you out they're going to say you know they're going to talk about politics they're going to talk about injustice they're going to talk about racism and sexism and transphobia that's in in progressive liberal i use those the same in those circles that's what prophetic means like a prophetic sermon a prophetic word uh mlk what you know martin luther king jr seen as like the ultimate prophet because he critiqued systems 
If you're in other circles, prophetic sermon means something different. It means that they're going to give you insight into God's will for the future and maybe how that's beginning to be materialized now. So Fostick help really in, in these popular ways. And I think uh, people like me don't spend enough time looking at how how people are learning about the Bible, about Christianity and stuff outside of church. So you could have been Presbyterian your whole life and learned something, but you're, there's still going to be other stuff in the air. Like if you read a magazine or if you listen to music or you do that, we, we learn things other than in formal religious settings. Um, so that's why when we have a lot of students who have no religious background from childhood or, or growing up, they've, they've discovered Christianity as an adult and chose it. And they come in and say, I, I know nothing about the Bible because I, I didn't grow up reading it. Well, they maybe never read about it, but they sure have heard people talking about it. So they, they already have... Uh, opinions form that sometimes you don't even know what those opinions are because you don't know where they came from. Right. So back to Jeremiah. So, you know, Fosdick was popularizing this stuff to the point where it's so popular now that language is still being used. See, some of you have heard of Fosdick, some of you know about Kendrick Lamar. So, uh, you know, um, so even like, it's, it's not just Kendrick Lamar, who's a, a very wildly uh, successful, popular uh, hip hop artist. Um, and so even the people who are going to be talking about him, it's not that Kendrick Lamar said this, but people who are going to be talking about Kendrick Lamar said, hey, he's just like Jeremiah. Right? Uh, so, uh, I don't, I don't know if any of you have listened to this album. Kendrick Lamar critiques injustice. Like, he critiques racism and poverty and all the sis governmental systems that, that do that. I mean, his critique is really good for, for what he's doing. And you don't have to read all these words, but, you know, here's a music critic uh, writing on an NPR uh, blog who's saying, here, let me explain to you people who might not know Kendrick Lamar, like, what he's like, and guess what? They, this guy, uh, Carmichael, went straight to Jeremiah. So, um, I'll read the part that's probably too small up there. Um, the Old Testament is full of prophets trying their damnedest to save the world. And more often than not, the first obstacle they must overcome is self. Self-doubt, self-loathing, and even personal aversion to self-sacrifice. Example of Moses, Noah, Elijah. Then there was Jeremiah. He suffered depression so badly, likely from carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, that students of the Bible refer to him as the weeping prophet. <coughs> So, uh, like prophets of old, Kendrick Lamar uses all this to explain the urgency of his message. And just uh, like Jeremiah did this thing we're going to learn about in a minute, so too Lamar spends the majority of the album alternating in this psychodrama. So, again, I'm just trying to get at... Uh, both trying to get you to think about Jeremiah. Did, do I know anything about Jeremiah? Did, have I ever heard anything about Jeremiah? And all of that. But uh, even if you haven't to realize this, this larger thing, that our understandings of things biblical and religious are also affected by the culture in which we live, even when, when we're not aware of it. I don't know, did I miss anything? What else did, like, things you know about Jeremiah that you thought she should have said that way? <laughs> <laughs> His call as a child. Ah, yes. Yes. 
So that, that's related to that passage that shows up. So Jeremiah, uh, the book starts out, Jer God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet, and he says, I can't do it because I'm only a youth. And that's where God says, hey, before you were, I formed you in the womb. I knew you, I know what I'm doing, right? And, and so you're going to do what I say. Is Jeremiah the one who said, I'll take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh? I don't think so. I think that's Ezekiel. But I could be wrong. Oh, no, I don't know everything. More, more likely. No, no, we'll, we'll find that out. Yeah. But doesn't he talk about the, what's God's word written on tablets of stone and now they're written on your heart? Yes, that's related. Yeah, yeah that's related to that new covenant um, in that way. So if you start thinking of other things, uh, let me know. So this is the... This is the I, the longer I've been teaching, the more I realize I can't just, it's not helpful to just jump in and start talking about a thing without talking about the world and the context in which we're reading it. Um, and you'll see how that's going to carry over into some other things I want to share with you about Jeremiah. Okay? What you do or don't know about Jeremiah. So let's all get on the same page then. How about that? <laughs> Up a little bit. And that's way too little for anybody to see. I, I, will, I will bring it back. The first big thing that, I, and I'll just talk about it so don't worry about looking at it. First big thing that I want to talk about is that the book of Jeremiah from its beginning to its end is situated in a particular period of ancient Israel's history. It talks about it. Almost every prophetic book will start out saying, in the years of blah, 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 blah. Um, but more than almost any other book, Jeremiah will mention in the year it, when this thing happened, when this thing happened, when this thing happened. It is historically grounded uh, over and over again. It's really clear. I am talking about what is going on in my, in I'm speaking as Jeremiah, I'm talking about what's going on in this moment. And what was going on in that moment, I think, is so essential for anybody who's going to read the book of Jeremiah. And it is a period, right, that Christians are used to talking about by using words like, oh, that was when the Babylonians occupied Judah. That was when the Babylonians destroyed Judah and burned the temple. And that was when the exile began. Now, those words, exile, destruction, all of that, are kind of, um, I don't know, they're kind of, intellectual words to me. I think it's really hard to catch the reality that the book of Jeremiah talks about events while Jerusalem and the country of which it was capital, Judah, was being bombarded and bombarded and bombarded by foreign armies. And I don't mean like just a little bit. The Babylonian of what we call the Babylonian Empire was increasingly putting pressure on Judah and the book of Jeremiah will talk about three different invasions of the Babylonian armies into Jerusalem. It will walk us, so maybe another way to say is Jeremiah is a book of war. It is a book written in the context of war and it's going to show us the lead up to that war. It's going to talk about what's going on during the war. It's going to talk about how the leaders behave during the war, how the priests behave during the war. It's going to talk about one invasion. Some of you who maybe know your biblical history better than others. Um, the, the Babylonians are going to come into Jerusalem three times. The first time, they do it in the year 
didn't work at all. And uh, 597 BCE, the Babylonian armies go in, they capture uh, the king, the leaders, and all the uh, kind of upper crust leadership class of the country, depose that, kill one of the kings, take the, the next king in line, take him, deport him to Babylon, deport all of the leadership class to Babylon, and put their own ruler, uh, or they have a Judean ruler, but it's one they chose that would work with them. So they do that. Come back 10 years later, and ultimately destroy the city. They burn the temple to the ground. They take another uh, large batch of the population. I'm going to come back to this language in a minute. They forcibly deported right, a large number of people, took them across the, you know, the Fertile Crescent, and put them to live in Babylon, which we actually have documents that are now being uh, translated just recently uh, now about some people who actually lived there from Jews in Babylon and what we know about them is that they they were settled and uh, kind of forced to be farmers so people who might have been uh, priests that might have been princes that might have been business people whatever everybody was forced to go on this agricultural land and, and produce food for the Babylonian kingdom. So, you know, this, this is an era of that, right? And I, I haven't even touched on it all. So I'm going to see if my little video works. Right? There's no sound, so that's, that's one less problem to have. <laughs> And I'll explain, if it, if it works, I'll explain what it, it will do. What it's going to do, oh, the video, you know, that's now gone. <laughs> oh, since I've already talked about it, I'll jump ahead and do that. I know why I moved it. Okay. So it, it'll clear up in just a minute. If you can see it. Here's what's going to happen. Down here is going to be time period. Okay? So it's going to start with 300 BCE, also known as BC. And that's going to start moving. And, and what it's going to do, it's going to show you who controlled this part of the world at different times. So let me get you oriented on the globe if you're not already there. Right, this is the Red Sea. That's the Sinai Peninsula. Maybe I should go way back here. This is Italy. <laughs> See the booth? Right, there's, there's Italy. This is the Mediterranean. Over here's the Persian Gulf. Right, so this would be Egypt. Like right here, Egypt. This is the continent of Africa down here. So where we want to keep our eyes is this little area right here. This would be where the modern state of Israel, the Palestinian territories are now, where ancient Israel would have been. At its largest extent, ancient Israel and Judah would never have been more than about that big. So that, that's where you want to keep your eyes. Send me my video which I did not create, but I found it very useful. So it's going to go back. Now, we'll want to pay closer attention. The time period we're talking about with Jeremiah is going to be somewhere when we get, like, let's say between, um, start paying real attention when you get, like, to 600, 500 in there, and we're going to want to notice the Babylonian Empire. How's that? How's this for the set? <laughs> Let's see what happens. Oh, I did have set. Hey, 
there we are. Yes, I know. We'll uh, find a way to do that. But of course, now I have to get back to my. Talk about yourself for just a minute. <laughs> and it doesn't go past 2006. I would love somebody who could bring it into the present. What it reminds you is that the land that we call the land of the Bible was rarely independent. It, the, throughout history, it was rarely independent. So, yes, we often think about, you know, the time of David as kingship. This was a very short blip in the uh, country's history. And uh, throughout this whole region, there has been, again, let's use modern words. Let's use empire, right? We've had occupation. We've had resistance movements, occupation, all of that. And so the modern states that you saw carved up at the end are an incredibly recent phenomenon that don't necessarily match the sensibility of the region. Those, those borders were created by Europeans um, to, to make sense after World War II, but they don't, they don't reflect the natural uh, affinities between people in the area. And maybe you can get a sense if you were looking at the ancient history that within the period of several hundred years, there were some of the largest empires known to the ancient world that were coming into Judah over and over again to the point where it's actually surprising that the Bible doesn't talk more about it, uh, about those realities. But the book of Jeremiah is our one of our uh, not the best, but it's, it's a really great insight into seeing how somebody, and I'm going to explain this, I don't think it was just, I don't think we hear just the voice of one person in the book of Jeremiah. I think we hear lots of voices in the book of Jeremiah, but we're seeing how a community is responding to foreign invasion, 
war and trying to understand the question of where is God in all these things that are happening to us. So, I, I told you I'd eventually get there. What's in the book of Jeremiah? <laughs> <laughs> the book of Jeremiah is really long. Right? It's one of the longer books in the Bible. Uh, Psalms is a little bit longer, but not by verses. It might have more chapters in Psalms, but it's not, it's not necessarily has more verses. Um, Isaiah is a little bit bigger, but then Jeremiah's next. I mean, this is a really big book. And if you've ever read any prophetic books, they're not really designed chronologically. They're not, they're not stories. They don't say this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And the book of Jeremiah is particularly messy. Biblical, scholars who spend their whole life studying Jeremiah can't agree on how it's organized. Because it, like, even when you do get stories, they don't seem in order. But here's a, here's a really basic outline. So the, the first 25 chapters or so is a, a lot of poetry. And it's going to offer some of those laments of Jeremiah uh, about how he's feeling. Um, then we're going to get some stories about Jeremiah's conflict with, his, with these leaders. There are three chapters that offer consolation and hopes for the future. That's where the lectionary gets almost all of its um, <laughs> readings are from the happy, 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 happy future, right? It, which is, in Jeremiah, is a very small clip. Um, there's going to be more stories about, Jeremiah actually gives us one account of the destruction of Jerusalem, the burning of the temple, the taking of people into exile. And then it's an odd thing. The uh, book, then near the end of it, it has all of these oracles, which is what we call like uh, prophetic statements against other countries. Like, what's that doing there? Um, like Moab and Ammon, these ancient places. And then at the very end, it gives us this much insight, or it tells this much of a story of what happened after Jerusalem fell and, and what the political situation was and um, how it was going to, what, what happened after that. So uh, we're going to talk about these next week. So for, for the reasons I just explained, there's no way in two weeks we're going to walk through the whole book of Jeremiah. So what I'd like, I'm going to propose that we do is we're going to talk about two of the major themes of the book of Jeremiah that run throughout this book because I find them incredibly challenging and by dealing with them, I find for myself that dealing with these really hard theological claims that the book of Jeremiah makes, it, it forces me to get really clear about how I'm going to read the Bible and how I'm going to use it. So I, I can kind of walk us through that. But I just kind of want to leave you with the heavy themes of the book of Jeremiah. Over and over and over, this book, however it's organized, will insist. This is not a little theme of Jeremiah. It's like the thing. That God is going to punish Judah for its disobedience by causing them to be defeated by the Babylonians. The book of Jeremiah is very clear that the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem is God's punishment on Judah for its sins. And particularly, I mean, it, it lists a lot of those sins, but one of the big sins that it's saying is because they've worshipped to other gods, right? And they, they've done other things. But I, I, right now, I don't want to take away the scandal of how, that hear, of how you hear that. It is God's doing 
that these this army is coming in and defeating you and it's actually your own fault. Right. Yep, the Jeremiah's, I mean, oh, oh, why are we gonna talk about the Bible if we can't talk about what it really says, right? Now, I'm not, I think we've gotta spend a lot of time thinking about what are we gonna do with a theme like that. And there are a lot of things I hope we don't do with a theme like that, and, and I'll talk about it. Oops. And, yeah, imagine saying this in, in your context. Over and over, when Jeremiah is telling stories, when the Babylonians are coming, Jeremiah is advising the leaders. He's going to the king, he's going to, the, to other leaders, and over and over he says, you have to submit to them. It is God's will for you to submit. Don't fight that. Capitulate. It, God is sending Babylonians to punish you, so you shouldn't resist Babylonians. <laughs> now, again, I, I realize we're, we're close to out of time, but I, I just want to kind of name, like, this does leave us with some questions of what are we going to do with themes like this. And it's not surprisingly, can you understand now why if you were on the lectionary committee, you might have done exactly the same thing, <coughs> right? Because Christians and, and everybody else, one way to get around problems like that is you just read selectively. You take the passages that you like, you take the passages that confirm your own belief system, that make you feel good or maybe push you just a little bit, um, and you just read selectively. So you take that one, you take that one, you take that one. Don't worry about it. It's best not to read the book. Right? <laughs> um, related to that, the, the ways that Christians have sometimes managed this is that they said, well, you know, um, we're gonna, we're just gonna untake the parts of this that we think help us see that God was preparing the way for Jesus. So messianically. So that thing about the branch, that thing about the new covenant, right? Well, that's what we're gonna take from that is promises. And so that what we're kind of doing in a lot of ways is that we're gonna, we're not gonna really recognize that when we do that, that kind of interpretation, I'm gonna say it bluntly, I think it's very anti-Jewish. Because what, it, what it's suggesting, and we can see this throughout history, is that when you say that the promises are only for you, but the judgment is for other people, right? You, you've given all the hope and all of the goodness to Christianity, and you haven't left any for the ongoing Jewish people. And that's why it's, it's uh, this one is, an, is another way of saying, Christians have this way of reading the Old Testament where when they see judgment, they assume that the judgment was for those people, but the hope is for us. So, yes, I can read Jeremiah, say some Christians. I can do it, and I can understand why God destroyed ancient Israel. That part, yeah, that's, that's historical. But the part that's for me is the part about, like, oh, well, what's going to happen in the future? Well, I don't know, can you tell by the way I've said that how disingenuous and arrogant I think that is? Because it's not wrestling with that reality that we've taken only what is affirming of our own beliefs. Um, in that way, Let's see. <clears throat> Uh, 
And, and one of the other problems with it is I think, I think it really feeds that stereotype is, see, that's the Old Testament God. The, the Old Testament God was wrathful and angry and vengeful, but man, that's why I love the New Testament God. That's a really bad way of reading the Bible, right? Because it's not, A, recognizing some of the problems of the New Testament, right? But it's not also taking seriously some of the claims of the old. And that's part of what my work is doing. Trying to say, even if I don't want to perpetuate this language that God's going to punish you for doing bad things, which I don't, I think it's also a really bad use of Jeremiah to say, see, anything that happens to you is God's punishment because that's the way God works. I'm not going there either. But what I'm going to try to kind of share with you next week is what are some other ways that this book can be life-giving or at least useful for people of faith that don't get into this trap of just taking the parts that we want or just saying, I'll take the good stuff, leave the bad stuff for other people or use the bad stuff against our neighbors. There are other ways to do that. So next week, previews of coming attractions, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about trauma theory. This is one of the main ways that uh, contemporary scholars are addressing books like Jeremiah. They're recognizing that this book, and actually most of the Old Testament, was put together in response to national trauma. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to see if we can begin to feel that a little bit, to begin at least to imaginally uh, begin to think about what are the practical and theological crises that people go through when everything about their world has been upended destroyed. And what kind of theologies help people be resilient in times of trauma? So that's kind of where we're headed next week. Um, and so um, I hope you'll come back so we can do something more <laughs> constructive. Um, and, and then I, but I want to end there just to see if we have a few minutes for questions, arguments, thoughts. Things you're hoping that we'll talk about next week. It, it in in the New Testament, you you see a lot of of stories of illness being attributed to sin. It, it, it do you? It seems like that pervasive in the New Testament. Is that really just originating from Jeremiah? No, no. I, and here's the way I would answer that question. I think that is, and it is a little conceptually complicated, but let me give it a shot. <clears throat> to the best of our knowledge, everybody in the ancient world, this time period, Old Testament, New Testament, pretty much before the Enlightenment, believed that the gods did everything. So we can, we can read that when we read documents from the Babylonians or documents from the Persians. All those people who, who did that, documents from the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. If you don't have the concept of like natural law, like gravity and germs and all of that, we see this, that, that ancient people believed that everything that happens was directly caused by a deity. And that, that would be true, I believe, for ancient Israel as well. So for ancient people, it was never a question of did God do this? Of course God did this. In Hebrew, the way you talk about it reigning is that God reigned. I mean, like reign, not like God reigned on it. Uh, uh, Throne, but like that rain, uh, drought, 
uh, everything was understood to be caused by God. A woman being infertile was understood to be God closing the womb. So when ancient people are kind of sorting through what's happening in the world, their question is not, did God do it? But why did God do it? Whereas, I'll speak for myself, I'm kind of a post-enlightenment kind of person. I do believe in uh, germs and genetics and all of that. So I'll be honest uh, that when something happens, it is not my default position to believe that God did it. So what that means is then my theological process is going to be different because I'm asking a different question. I might believe God created the world and somehow underneath it all, but I, but I don't, and I want to be clear about that, I don't believe that God punishes people for sin in these ways. I, I don't. I could be wrong, but I don't believe that. Um, Jeremiah did. Um, and so my question is, and a lot of the things in the New Testament seem to assume that as well. Paul did, right? So part of my question is, I still think I can read it faithfully and say that. That I don't share all of the assumptions, but I don't have to throw it away because I, I see what I lose when I throw it away. Right? And, and I, I've really grown by kind of wrestling with Jeremiah. So let's see what you think next.